Hello and welcome back to Insemination, the podcast that is all things donor conceived. My name is Laura High and I am your chaotic sperm donor baby of the interwebs and oh my gosh, I have missed you guys. Thank you so much for pausing with me these last few weeks as we did the protest and I recovered because I gotta say a little bit more of an emotional toll than I expected so I really appreciate everybody's patience with me. More content, more videos is going to come out about the protest. It was such an incredible success. We've already had some really amazing opportunities already come because of the protest. I can't announce them yet because they're still kind of up in the air, but we're we're really excited and things are... I don't know, maybe, maybe looking hopeful. Maybe I'm being way too optimistic. I don't know. I've had way too much Halloween candy. Anyway, okay. Uh, I really am excited to get to this next episode with my wonderful fellow donor conceived person, Aaron Maya. Now, Aaron has written a musical about being donor conceived, which as a theater kid, I am freaking out about. I am so excited. She's going to have a concert debut January 8th. We're all going to be there together. And I'm so excited that she's come on to talk about this. So please welcome on Erin Maya as she tells us her story and all about her amazing donor conceived musical. And welcome to the podcast, Erin Maya. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It has been has it only been like two weeks since the protest? Oh my god! It's been two, like yeah, so, yeah, two or three weeks, something like How that. How are you? Kind of like, um, because uh, uh, you know, Aaron was one of the amazing donor conceived people who joined us at the protest to help represent, and which meant the world um, that you know that you you came and made the time to do that. How did? you how how was that experience for you and how are you like in the aftermath kind of dealing with it because like for me it's like emotions are coming in waves yes um I will say one thing that I'm feeling is like buzzing since that I have never been surrounded by so many donor conceived people at once and like I would say you know but I also lots of waves of emotions hearing so many people's stories oh thinking God. about my own all that yeah. stuff but overall this feeling of community I realized that I have never felt part of any community oh that is what I thought about on the plane ride home I was like I've never felt part of like you know I grew up Irish and raised as an Irish person I'm a little bit Irish after all but um I never felt part of like that community or like uh, and then I don't feel part of like the Latino community either even though there's like bits and pieces I've never felt fully part of a community yeah um I've always felt like I had like a pinky toe in each pool but never felt fully part of a group and to feel this was the first weekend I ever wow. felt like this is what it feels like oh to feel God. part of a community and really feel like you belong and I'm like this is wild <laughs> well I mean it's I feel amazing. I feel like you know you saying like I've always felt like a pinky toe in a lot of different com- in like mm-hmm. communities I feel like every donor conceived person um listening to this went <gasps> That's I, I feel like that's mm-hmm. so common for donor conceived people. So true. But honestly, I I felt the same thing. I I really was like I didn't realize how much I needed this feeling of community, and mm-hmm. it was like suddenly like this hole was being filled that like I didn't know was there. Yes, that is exactly how it felt. It was like. Um, it felt I was like, oh my gosh, I'm finding like my little tube buddies. Like we were all sitting on the tube together, yeah. on the shelf together. I was like, hi, for real. And honestly, it felt like we were family. It yeah, really felt like we really were did. family. It was so natural. I never felt, and I was nervous going there because I was like, who do I really know? I know a couple people here yeah. and there from events, like yeah. um, Cassandra, of course. Oh, like, everybody fo- loves Cassandra. Everybody loves Cassandra. Somebody said she's the Tom Hanks of our community, she and really that is. is literally the greatest description because everyone loves Tom Hanks. Uh, <laughs> Cassandra is one of those people. Uh, if anyone missed, like Cassandra has, uh, uh, we did an episode um, earlier with with Cassandra, and uh, Cassandra is one of those people everybody likes. Everyone. Even the industry is like, oh no, Cassandra's cool. Like even <laughs> they feel comfortable with Cassandra, and that's sort of like my barometer like if someone doesn't like Cassandra that person's not right like no, that, that's not no, a good person. that says everything about them <laughs> no that that's like no there's a problem with you like mm-hmm. this is no everyone loves Cassandra and Cassandra's also like the first person that like everybody meets in the community first person I met 
ever. Yeah. First donor conceived person besides like, you know, my brother that I grew up with. Yeah. Um, first donor conceived person I ever met. And mm-hmm. literally I posted on our like the We Are Donor Conceived forum. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey guys. I'm in a band and we're playing tonight and I wrote this song about my donor conceived experience would love to meet some of you not thinking anybody would actually go because it's New York. Oh no, but it's Cassandra. <laughs> but Cassandra's a lot of and, old show And Cassandra and, um, and this other girl, I don't want to say her name because I don't know if she would want me to say her name totally, or not. Totally, totally. But um, I love her as well. Both of them showed up and came to the show and we had coffee beforehand and I heard their stories. It was the first time I like <gasps> sat down with another donor conceived person and like heard their stories and yeah. Yeah, she's just the best. She's, you know what? We we can just this can just be a like we love Cassandra this episode. Is, <laughs> That's what this can be. Um, that is the theme of the episode. And you know, she's just one of our best advocates. And I'm just I'm so grateful that like we've got her on our team. Like, thank mm, God, thank God, thank God. No, we we've got a freaking star. Um, but no, I, I, it really was. And Cassandra was also at the protest as well. Yes, yeah, so I knew she'd be there. Like we, we took the plane. We were on the same plane together. Mm-hmm. Ironically, uh, we didn't plan it. But, um, but yeah, I really thought because I can be a little socially awkward sometimes. Surprisingly, Yo, ditto. Really, people are always surprised when I say that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that you're saying that. But because oh we're both I'm in so... like entertainment, like different mediums. But yeah, but are you in the same kind of vent where it's like I would rather be on stage mm-hmm. making jokes about how decrepit my boobs look, which is exactly what I did, then, like, be at a dinner party. Absolutely. I would much rather have that because I'm like, that, that, I'm like, I don't know the rules of dinner. Like, I feel like everybody Mm -hmm. got an instruction manual on how to be social and I just never got it and I'm still (laughs) trying to figure it out. Um, And it feels like, but I did feel like when we were with donor conceived people, Mm -hmm. I was like, it, it felt like the first time where it was like, I didn't need the rule book. Yes. I didn't need it because we all spoke the same. I spoke the same language for the first yes. time. All of us spoke the same language. I yeah. feel like I've never spoken the same language as no. anyone, really. So, yeah, I'm so with you. And yes, I also I would prefer to sing than speak. Oh, God. Yeah. Which is an issue because life is not a musical, unfortunately. That OK. What what are your favorite musicals? Because I was a theater major and like I grew you up. Were? On, yeah, Where'd you go? I went to Nazareth College in Rochester, New York. But I was oh. like. Full on music theater kid. Like yes. I, I was one hundred percent that stereotypical asshole music theater kid. <laughs> well, I not asshole, but like annoying music theater kid. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, oh god, one of my favorite musicals. I always like the weird ones, of course. So I, I, love, I that. love like Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Oh, I um, love it. I love Fun Home. Any mm-hmm. anything about dead dads, I'm in. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it okay. just feels good. Um, what else? Waitress. Nice. Um, uh, Wicked. Wicked is like, yeah, it's commercial, but like, there's a reason why everyone loves it. Girl, don't everyone not feels, knock it. It's everyone a feels, good musical. It's literally maybe a perfect musical. It's fabulous. And yeah. it's it, it really does, in my opinion, have like such that lovely mix that between like, it does have great music, catchy mm. songs, characters that we love. And it's also just, it's so, I, I would say, visually fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's such a spectacle as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's great. W- who would be like some of your favorite composers? Oh, gosh. I mean, obviously, like, Stephen Schwartz. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Like, mm-hmm. come on. Oh, no. He's, he's um, great. Oh, God. I was listening. I was re-listening to the uh, Moana soundtrack, and I'm like, this is so fucking perfect. Like, it's so good. How Far I'll Go is one of the most perfect songs. That's one of those songs that, like, you think, like, how did the world exist before mm-hmm. this song was around? <laughs> I don't understand. I Oh, my God. I'm blanking on the song. I The, the song where in Moana where it's... Um, uh, is it the rock w- song? No, it's the um, it's the one where the uh, the she's listening to her ancestors for the first time. It's like she just hit the drum. Oh uh, my god! And now it's yes, and, yes, and yes, it's yes, it's yes. Lin Manuel Miranda song. Mm-hmm. That's why, um, why am I blinking on that song title? I uh, we know too. who we are. Yes, which w- weeping. I weep every time. People weeping. I weep oh every god. time I hear that song. That's <sighs> like I I have a um I have a hype. Uh, playlist that I play like before a show mm-hmm. and I play that every- and that's part of it because it just it, it's just it gets me in the emotional kind of vibe but I weep every time I hear that song and I'm just like mm-hmm. fuck you Lin-Manuel <laughs> you know what I didn't need I was fine being emotionally problematic for myself but like whatever this is fine. just opening us up just, just one um, note at a time <laughs> oh my gosh but no it it, it was um 
The, yeah, it's, God, we're we're gonna get uh, I know. sidetracked. Okay, we're, I'm sorry, I'm so no, no, ADHD, no, no, like legit. Me too. So. <laughs> uh, me too. Not an official diagnosis, but actively oh, working I'm official, to get. Girl. You're official. I'm official. I'm trying to catch up. I, I need to get that <laughs> official diagnosis because it's like we we. I know it's there. I know it's it's like I there's. Mean, I feel like most people in entertainment are. I feel like otherwise, how else would you like connect all the random dots? I mean, I feel like it's part of it. <laughs> One other person I would actually love to sort of like give a shout out for for the specifically the protest was um, Jacoba. Jacoba. So awesome. And thank you for introducing me to her because oh I had God. never met her before. I, but I obviously, like everyone else, love that documentary. But she is just such a bad. She's exactly who she is in the yeah. documentary in real life. She, she is like such a real person. For anyone who, who doesn't know, uh, Jacoba Ballard, uh, I did an interview with her. She was actually my second epi- a second interview on this podcast. Please go re-listen to it. Jacoba was like the head narrator, essentially, for the documentary Our Father on Netflix. If you've not watched it, please, God, go watch it. It is, it is uncomfortable. It is, it can be a very triggering thing, especially if you have like any history with sexual assault. Um, it, it absolutely can be but um if you are in a place where you can watch it i ask that you watch it um and jacoba was you know she's one of dr klein's biological children and she put fertility fraud so publicly on the map Mm -hmm. and i will always be so grateful for what she did not just for getting fertility fraud on the map but she got donor conceived issues on the map because mm-hmm. once that documentary came out, everyone started listening more to donor conceived issues because if they were like, wow, if Dr. Klein could essentially get away with this, what else can the fertility industry get away with? Yep. And there are over 100 siblings now, by the way, in that pod. Are you serious? Yeah, more people have just been found. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's over 100 now. And yeah. it's and it, it, it's. We we all owe all of us owe a debt of gratitude to Jacoba. But the thing that I just appreciated so much about Jacoba was um, she she genuinely is just the nicest person, and she is like the most well known donor conceived person worldwide at this point. Oh, absolutely. And she and it was so funny when we were like trying to like get people to come to the protest the day before handing out flyers and people were like literally treating her like a celebrity it was like the <laughs> coolest it was so cute i'd be like this is jacoba from our father and they'd be like oh my god it's a celebrity get a picture with her um she's such a good sport about it she's too. such a good sport but what i watched her do was she was there to support other donor conceived people like this was the protest was the first time a lot of donor conceived people were publicly coming forward and telling their story and she really was like all about supporting everybody else and making sure that everybody else felt safe felt backed up felt comfortable and that's really what she did and the fact that somebody who has had as much experience as her as someone who ha- has like i don't know a better way to say it than other like than her resume mm-hmm. the fact that she that was what she decided like i'm going to spend my time doing is making sure everybody feels supported was like oh my god i just i love that woman so much i i yeah. will I, it, like protect her at all costs for real. She's like the mama of she the community. She is truly. the mama of the community. She and really is the reason why so many people even know that we exist. Yeah, she is. Because it's like people don't think of, they only think of babies when they yeah. think of donor conception. They just like never think of the fact that the babies turn into adults yeah. and what happens afterwards. And I feel like she's like the person mm-hmm. that made people be like, whoa, didn't even think about that. Yeah. Um, and like introduce the terminology, really. She really did, and and it's it, it, and and it's not to you know like sort of like step sidestep anybody who has been doing advocacy for years. Like you know, thank God it was it was just Jacoba put it on such a public scale mm-hmm. that it became. And the documentary Our Father, I feel like, really made this issue so accessible and consumable that everybody could watch it in a way and understand it. Mm-hmm. It the documentary was extremely well made. Like it, it just was yeah. phenomenally produced. Mm-hmm. And I'm just I'm so grateful. Um but I would love to sort of now uh do another little a little jazz box sidestep um <laughs> into I'd love to first talk about like your story mm-hmm. and where like uh you know before we get into all the amazing creative work that you've done 
is kind of just start at the beginning of your origin story because that is how I feel like all do- it's like donor can see people we don't have a conception story we have an origin story it's so true so oh, let's gosh. start with let's start with yours so like what year what year were you made because we weren't conceived we were made we were made, we were I, made. I was made in uh, 1987 nice. uh, the 80s were definitely I was conceived also in 1987 really oh god we're going to have to I'm gonna have to find out who your doctor was. Oh my god! Well, <laughs> this oh, always is was weird. it was it New York City? Yeah. Oh shit. Uh, was it the Upper East Side? Yes. Oh no! Oh, no! This is always good thing we didn't date. Good <laughs> thing. Oh my god! Oh shit! Um, I mean, we know we're not siblings, but like yeah, we know we're not siblings. Oh my god! It's always kind of like exciting though when you find this out. Oh like, shit! Yes. Okay. Um, oh, we're gonna I, have to talk about this later. We're gonna have to talk about this like, Pause. Like, no. Pause. Yes. Okay. Oh my right. god. All right. Um. Yeah. So 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was made. Mm-hmm. Um. And oh my god, it's so weird to even like tell my story. It's been a while. Um. Let's see. So my. Dad, I was like I, I for me was like the first one made in the in this clinic. Really? Yeah. You were the OG. I was the OG in this clinic. I was also my 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 parents were my doctor's first patient. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh wow. So like, do you know like how? Because because like when we were made, mm-hmm. like yes, donor conception had been around for like a bit. It was still taboo. As but it was. Fu- can, I, can I curse on this? Oh fuck! Curse away. It's taboo as fuck. <laughs> it was taboo as fuck. <laughs> but like, so were you? Um, like how? What was the process like for your for your parents? Let's mm-hmm. like let's start there. Was it like were your parents allowed to pick a donor? Okay, so so my parents uh, they were they're really young, like early twenties. Mm. Um, my parents, my my dad uh, had cancer at nineteen. Oh my god! When they were engaged, <gasps> they were high school sweethearts. Um, he got cancer. Oh, your poor parents. Oh, my God. Yeah, like literally went through hell. Um, and so, uh, you know, he he did chemo. All of that never, you know, stored sperm or anything yeah. like that. They were they're young. They you were know? young. So when it came time, so when he was in the clear, cancer free, um, for this time being anyway. Um, so after the chemo treatments, my parents were ready to start their lives finally after this awful thing. Mm -hmm. And they found that my dad's sperm count had been killed by the chemo and he was unable to have kids. Um, and you know, this was the eighties and people did not talk about this. No, why would we talk about things? No. Why would we ever talk about about things? Especially if you're Irish Catholic, why would you ever talk about things? (laughs) I I was a Polish Catholic. So I you, totally get you that. Get yeah, it. Yeah, Catholicism yeah. very hush hush. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how is your self loathing going? Oh, <laughs> it's a daily practice. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. uh, definitely personality staple. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they basically were like, okay, what can we do? What are our options? And donor conception was still very hush hush, mm-hmm. and so they found a doctor who was doing it, um, and I think it was more of his like side practice kind of thing um and basically i don't know why that just I gave me I that oh. it, me, it makes my nose wrinkle up yeah it's like <laughs> i don't yeah oh yeah it's it my side hustle of sperm side, side of my sperm side hustle <laughs> um, i just collect it on the side <laughs> here are my trophies oh my god Blah. so um so yeah so they went to him and basically he said um like knowing that you guys are Catholic, um, I will I will pick the donor for you, so you don't feel like you're playing God, which I think is funny because it's like, oh, so you'll volunteer to play God? Okay. Um, Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. I I okay. 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 We need. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a second. Because I I don't remember the last time I I said this, but one of the things. So like my parents weren't allowed to pick my donor as well mm-hmm. and because the clinic was like no we match the donors up with the dads as best we could between hair color eye mm-hmm. color ethnicity but the clinic said and like my parents like this is not why they chose the clinic in the least bit the clinics this was just happened to be the one that they stopped in but the clinic said that um the number one thing they matched before anything else was religion that was the number That's one interesting <laughs> i thought you were gonna say ethnicity i did not expect religion because no, that Makes sense. Yeah. 
But this is the fertility industry we're so, fucking dealing with. Oh, so not going to make sense. Yeah, because really, like, you can't miss that, like, Protestant and Methodist sperm. I'm like, ugh. Oh, um, my God. Wait. And then they and then they matched your parents with. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, my God. I, I haven't done the, the stand up joke in a little bit, but it, it was. Um, oh, God, because this used to be in my set. I have I have to bring it back, maybe, because I, I would tell that joke and I, I would be like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, because religion really matters to guys masturbating in cups for, for cash. <laughs> <laughs> like selling their smart like it was just like yeah I don't think this is oh boy uh, but yes my my dad uh, is Catholic and my donor is a hundred percent Ashkenazi Jewish makes um, so much sense which is why people <laughs> always ask me they're like how did you not know that you were Ashkenazi like how didn't you know and I'm like because that was literally the thing that the clinic told my parents was like this is the thing that we match before and anything so, else yep so that was like okay mm -hmm. nope. Nope. Well, they did the same thing to my parents, except with ethnicity. So, um, basically, they just the now doctor... that to me, like, legitimately, like, oh yeah, that that matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically, he was like, so I will pick a donor that resembles your husband, that is just like that's Irish, like your husband, and we'll do the procedure. They call it a procedure. We'll do the procedure, and then obviously you'll. You know, I guess make love. I don't know what he said. Make basically, it just assume if you get pregnant that it's yours, and that's how it went. Um, Wait, what? They, I feel like doctors told a lot of parents this. Wait, they're gonna like we're gonna do the procedure, then you're gonna go home have sex, you go, and you're just gonna pretend like. And this then didn't if you happen? get pregnant, just pretend. Yeah, just assume it's yours. Oh my god, it's like cognitive dissonance in its highest form. Oh. My God. But, like, I also have empathy for my young parents. Yeah, I for like want it For, like, listening to this old doctor and oh being like, God. okay, this is what he told me, to, told us to do. And if we get pregnant, okay, I'm going to assume it's mine because you want to believe that it's yours. Oh I'm. St it's still not ethically okay. No, it isn't. But, but I, I also have a lot of empathy for like totally. for them in that regard. So anyway, so oh then, no, all my judgment goes to the doctor. Yeah, on that one of just like, dude, what? Like what the actual? Like I get it. Like okay, this was the eight. But I'm like you. You still like how was there? How even in the eighties didn't somebody go like maybe this is a little unethical? Like, yeah. I, I don't even know how, like, anybody even in the 80s would think, like, that was, like, a good plan. And th th there's no fault. No notes. Yep. No notes. No notes. Yeah. So, anyway, so my mom got pregnant, and they were really, really happy. And then I came out, and um, my parents are both, uh, they're blue-eyed Irish folks. And then I came out looking like this <laughs> with my big brown eyes. And, um... I don't know about all of you out there, but I personally didn't pay attention in biology class and science class. So um, I feel like if I had, I would have been able to put together myself two and two that two blue eyed people cannot make a brown eyed person. But I was probably sleeping in class <laughs> during that point in time. And so I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. So, yeah, so I have these big brown eyes, and um, and then just basically, as a kid, I was just, like, very, very hyper aware of the fact that I didn't look like anyone else. Anyway, my brother also came from donor conception. Um, Same donor? No. Oh, my so, God. So I found out, I don't want to tell his story because it's not my story to totally. tell, but basically I ended up finding out that I was donor conceived. My dad ended up, the cancer came back, and it came back again oh, and no. again and again. I'm so sorry. The guy had, like, the like the worst luck ever, and he was, like, such a fighter. And so um, he battled with this for, like, oh, God, I don't know, 13 years or something. That's horrible. He ended up, he ended up passing away when I'm I was so in sorry. sixth grade. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so he passed when I was in sixth grade, and then when I was a freshman in high school... So it's like three years later mm -hmm. um, when I was a freshman in high school, uh, people always used to comment on the fact that like me and my brother look nothing alike because we really we don't look anything alike at all. He has like big blue eyes and um, we just don't have any mm -hmm. similar features. I have some features of my mom like I have like her teeth um, and her nose. And then my brother has a lot of features of like 
my mom and and interestingly enough kind of like looks a lot like my dad when he was younger okay ironically but anyway um it's just coincidence but uh so freshman year i just remember like sitting in the car and being really pissed off and mouthing off to my mom that like somebody some like old neighbor somebody had said something about like you and your brother look nothing alike i would never know that you two are siblings he looks a lot like your father well, you two just don't look anything alike why do people feel like commenting those things is an appropriate thing to say to a child people comment on this kind of stuff all, all the, the time. time they do on um, that when babies they say oh the baby looks like this parent baby looks like th like this is just something that people do and i think that they really need to stop it needs to be not certainly not actively to the kid like it's like mm -hmm. th this is not you understand like this these are the kinds of shit that's gonna like live and fester in a kid's head forever <laughs> forever forever and it's like and you don't <laughs> know the kid's story at all like mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't talk about it yeah like, and it also like it insinuates that like something is weird yeah um, and and so this used to happen all the time. People yeah. used to like comment on it, and I felt very hyper aware of it. Like mm -hmm. Christmas time, we would do like a group family photo on the stairs of all the cousins, and I just remember being able to like look at that photo when it would come back because you know film back then, no iPhones. Um, mm -hmm. And I just remember like looking at the photo in the like in this sea of like red and light brown hair and blonde hair it would just be like there's the black sheep right there like i could find myself in two seconds oh um my gosh. but anyway so this one day for some reason i just really was really ticked off and i just told my mom about it for whatever reason that day she just decided to come out with it and she was like but how old are you so i was how old are you when you're a freshman? Like 14? 14. I also, 14. my parent, my parents told me when I was 14 too. Yes, because when you mentioned that at your comedy show, when yeah. I saw you at Caroline's, I remember I was like, ah, <laughs> like we have this in common. Um, oh my god! Which is like 14, I feel like is a really bad age to tell. I mean, no age. Well, young. Young, young is the best. Young, like it should never be. It should never be like an age when like you find out. Like it should mm -hmm. always be part of the story. Yes, yeah, so it's part of the narrative. But like when you're a preteen and you're trying to figure yourself out as it is, and also your dad passed away three years before. Yeah, it's just I think the that's... timing was really rough. But all. But also, I'm glad that she told. I'm really glad that glad she told, she told me. you. Yeah. Well, especially for like our age group, it's mm -hmm. just so common never to tell. Like the fact that we mm -hmm. were told at 14 is like a fucking miracle for yeah, our age group. It's definitely a blessing. But it is. To... I was so weird with it. I just for me, I, I absorbed the information and I was just I remember going like, I knew it. Yes. I knew something was the fuck up. Me too. Me too. And I go, the first thing I thought was. Oh my God! What ethnic? The first thing I said was, "What ethnicity is my donor?" Oh my! Or gosh. the donor. Sorry, I know like terminology these days. Some people don't like. I'm so used to calling it my donor, even though technically that's not correct because he wasn't my donor. Okay. Well, in my but opinion, do donor can see people individually. Use whatever the fuck term you okay, want. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just want to put that out there. No, PC. Like I know that that's like in my opinion to that you know I I really think that like obviously recipient parents, the general public, donors, the industry really need mm -hmm. to like listen to donor can see people in terms of techno uh in terms of terminology mm -hmm. but in my opinion like how we refer to our own individual stories refer to ho however the fuck you want to i appreciate yeah. it because it'll come out several times i'm trying to like correct myself these days no, like girl, and with my script I, i'm like combing through it trying to like change use what the terminology the i think when we like refer to ourselves as a community like yes whatever is the i would say the I would say communal right term like mm -hmm. sure but if it's your personal story mm -hmm. use what is right for you I mean everybody sure. like how you refer to like do you when as we're going through this when we talk about your donor do uh, we do you want to use the term donor do you want to use biological parent biological father like what oof. do you prefer god um I don't know it really changes like, and that's constantly. legit I, but I, that's... I guess we usually like Bio father, bio father, bio parent. I don't know. Which yeah. is like that's legit. Everyone has a different answer, mm -hmm. and that's all okay. There's no way. There's no, in my opinion, how we refer to our donors: biological father, biological parent, biological mm -hmm. mom. There's like everyone does what is right for them. Yeah, yeah. I just think that 
recipient parents, donors, and the general public need to respect how the, we... Yeah, the general, ter- like the yes, terminology that, that is I do. most uh, accepted. But so, I, so how you want to refer to your own story, then yeah. And yeah. and we should all obviously respect how each individually we all do it. But mm-hmm. anyway, that's my rant. But, no, I appreciate um, it. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, you were immediately like, what is my ethnicity? Immediately, I was like, because I had the same reaction that you did, where I was like, this makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, even though there was also a part of me that was like dying inside because like my dad, I mean, not only it was like a double whammy because it was like not only was my dad not my biological dad, yeah. but also he's not here. You couldn't have that talk. moment of healing yes. and okayness the, with him. It was like, oh, there's never going to be closure about this. Yeah. We're never going to be able to like That's have hard. a powwow. I'm never going to be able to like, like be like why did you keep this from me also like you know Carrie Washington who just came out which is like we love this love you Carrie love Love you Carrie Carrie. um Carrie when she she talked about in her book and interviews about how she told her dad now I can finally love you unconditionally because before this secret before I knew about this I was loving you under a condition of this secret. Mm -hmm. Um, And now I can show you what unconditional love looks like. Oh, God, I'm going to get choked up. No, but it really was Um, like she, I'm, God, God, thank God she is publicly sharing her story. I mean, seriously. Yeah. And she's like, go, and she's like publicly showing her vulnerability and like how she's processing it. It, Like, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful. And she's really building a bridge too between like donor can see people and recipient parents, which I think is really important. She's doing such a good job. Like, I'm just so grateful to, and and the fact that it's also, it's Carrie motherfucking Washington. (laughs) Like if we had like anybody to (laughs) be like, I'm like, cause she's one, she's just so wonderful. She's amazing. She's a brilliant artist, an incredible creative. And she is just like, I, I feel like the, the like everybody is like, oh, I love Carrie Washington. Like everyone loves her. She's like a badass. She's so, she's so fabulous. So the fact that I, that we're like, we get Carrie Washington? Oh my <laughs> she's God. She's on our team. She's on our team. I'm like, win. Oh my God. I mean, I'm also like, I'm also like, I'm sorry, Carrie Washington, that you are part of our community also at the same time because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a weird it's a weird community to be like, yeah, you're part of us, but also I'm sorry. Welcome, and I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Here's yeah. here's the fruit basket. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, what? I didn't get a fruit basket. <laughs> it's it's filled with festive festive fruits and nuts. <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, so I I didn't get to have that, um, and so it was. I'm really sorry. That's hard. Thank you. I appreciate it. But um, but yeah. So like the first thing I really was thinking about, like in order to like, okay, what? Where's the silver lining I can find with this? Which was, which was, what's my ethnicity? Okay, now I get information. I also want to say, as a fourteen year old, like trying to find a silver lining when you're fourteen is really hard. That's just not how your brain is geared no, at that point. No, not at all. No. Especially when you're emo as fuck. Oh, like were I you, was. Were you a hot topic kid? Oh, honey. Yes. yes. Did yeah. you have the fishnet gloves? Fishnet gloves and the sweatbands. Nice. And the yes. all of that. And the very dark eyeliner, which is oh, still a yeah. thing. I have never let that go. No, I'm obviously, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm still an eyeliner girly. Thank yeah. you so much. It will never leave. I I mean, I still, they, they, wait, the, the, the Jenko jeans? Yes. Yeah, I still actually, I'm like, I kind of want them back because I Somebody still. Somebody told me Jenko jeans were going to like make a comeback because I'm the kids are it. wearing like what what we used to wear. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, bring them back. Bring them the fuck. I mean, yes, the bottoms got so frayed and dirty and wet. I don't care. I loved them <laughs> because like I also like have a huge butt. And <laughs> me too. <laughs> and it was like back when we were kids, like it it was heroin chic. Like you were not allowed to have curves. Like they mm-hmm. they didn't cut for butts at all when we were kids. Mm-hmm. And Janko jeans were like the only thing I could wear that like was actually comfortable. Mm-hmm. That actually yeah. c- like covered my butt. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I love these. But yeah, yeah they're okay. the best. Yeah. So super emo. Um, mm-hmm. And then you add this to the mix. So anyway, so yeah, so the first thing I said was like, oh my God, so like, what's the ethnicity of the donor? Yeah. And my mom was like, I don't know. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, there's got to be paperwork. There's got to be like documents of some sort. Yeah. And she was like, and she was like, no, that's not how they did it back then or not how this doctor did it. So they- you don't you don't have a donor number either. 
No. I don't have a donor number. No, and yet. there's not even docu- – like, there's no. no documentation. There's no documentation. And, like, so I made my mom call the office, and they pretty much laughed at her. Oh, my God. And they were like, well, if there were documents, like, if there was any kind of documentation of this, it would have been um, – I guess deleted or thrown away after 10 years or something because that that's like a thing mm-hmm. um, but they were like but we don't even know like if he did keep that um, and yeah nothing no information so I was like wait so so there I don't know the ethnicity of him and also like I don't know his medical history like I don't know anything about this person but he's out there probably yep um, so yeah, so that was like really complicated, and she like my mom also let me know that nobody knew, and so I sort no of no one knew in your family. No one, knew. <gasps> no one knew. My parents didn't want anybody to know. Oh, shit. Um, my dad wanted to be a dad so badly, and he just really wanted uh, he he wanted everyone to think that we were biologically his. You know. Um, even though, I mean, I got to say, like, I, like, really won in the in the lottery when it comes to, like, dads. Like, I only had him for a very, very short time on Earth. But, like, he, I, I always was very well aware of the fact that, like, he lived for being a parent and, like, that it really killed him that he couldn't do things that other dads could mm. do. Um, and that, like, when he would miss out on, like, events like uh, daddy-daughter dances or, like, you know, holidays and stuff because he was, like, sick all the time. Like, I knew how much that that bothered him. Um, so, like, I just always was very well aware of the fact mm-hmm. that, like, he wanted to be there, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, so no one knew. And so because I knew this about my dad, about how much he loved being a father, I felt a responsibility to keep this going, keep this secret going and uphold it. Because um, it felt like I was, like, in charge of, like, his legacy, and like that's a really huge responsibility as a teenager to feel yeah. to feel like you have to keep this going um, because he's not here anymore to like speak up for himself. Um, and like this is how people remember him as a dad, which like, of course, he was my parent. But like, you know what I mean? Um, so I had a really rough like teen years and my 20s were a a fucking hot mess if you don't mind me asking Mm -hmm. did it feel like you almost lost your dad again yeah absolutely it it completely felt like i lost him all over again and it felt like it put a divide between us that um i was like oh i'll never be able to close this divide because we can't have a conversation about this um and, you know, when my dad passed, um, I was a preteen and I was not a joyride, <laughs> you know, like I was everyone deals with grief when a parent is dying. Everyone deals with it very differently. And a lot of it has to do with your age, age, mm-hmm. personality, all of that. And the way that I dealt with it was I didn't want to engage really. I wanted to just like focus on singing and playing pretend and, you know, and I didn't want to engage. And so me and him, the last couple years, really, um, we fought a lot. And like, there are, there's a lot of like bumping heads. Me and him are both like very strong personalities. Um, so I kind of like, when I learned this, I kind of felt like I already was dealing with a lot of guilt Mm -hmm. about the, like, the way we had sort of like ended things. Mm. And so this just like deepened that, you know? Oh, shit. I'm sorry. So thanks. I appreciate it. So yeah, so the, my teen years and like 20s were just a hot mess of like trying to keep the secret inside that felt like it was like trying to claw itself out. And like, yeah. And like, I'll be, and like, I will be totally honest because like, I feel like it's important to talk about these kind of things. Um, like I was a cutter for years and, and I didn't, under, I didn't understand why. And it was never that I wanted to kill myself, which I think is like a common misconception when it comes to cut, cutting. Um, like I didn't want to kill myself. I just wanted a release and I couldn't yeah. explain what that was. But like I wanted a release and I think I look back and I realize I'm like, oh, it's because I had this like secret inside that I couldn't talk about. And so like there was that physical manifestation, this physical release, and that would give me some like 
relief. You no, know, no, I, I struggled with self harm as well. Yeah, and no, so I totally. I, I feel like for DCP yeah. donor conceived people, it's that's like a common thing. I've talked to a lot of people about it, and like a lot of donor conceived people tend to be that. I feel like even before they know that they're donor conceived people, your body knows that there's something up. Like like what Kerry Washington was saying, like she knew something was off. The amount of us, I mean, and obviously like all of our, like there are some people who are gen, who were genuinely blindsided, mm -hmm. but there are, I would God, there's so many of us who also were like, I knew something was up. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew something was, was off in some ways. I could smell it. Yeah. And it was... And I remember, like, it, it's so weird because I think, like, in some ways, finding out I was donor conceived gave me way too much confidence <laughs> in, like, my ability to, like, uh, you know, have, like, be you know have like you know b basically like psychic awareness because mm -hmm. i remember it was just like i fucking knew it because i remember i was like was i adopted was i switched at birth mm -hmm. did some something happened like i was like S something is not adding up and i mm -hmm. couldn't figure it There's out a, like you are a square peg in a round hole and you can't put your finger yeah. on why no like and i i look exactly like my mom oh uh, really i'm a carbon copy of my mom mm -hmm. um i yeah, no, we we look so it was always like this, but I look so much like my mom, mm -hmm. and but I never put it together about not being biologically related to my dad for some reason, like some some reason that like didn't connect. Yeah, you just uh, assumed that like your um like you got more genes from your mom. Yeah, sometimes people look more like one parent than the other, and that was just I don't know why. But as soon as I was like, it makes sense. Everything makes sense, um, and. and yeah, and it was, it kind of just, at least for me, it just sort of sat there for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's why when, like, I would say, like, I, whenever there's, like, recipient parent who's, like, my child is, like, 14. They don't care about being donor conceived. I'm, like, just wait. Oh, God. Just wait. I'm, like, I'm, like, yeah, I didn't care either until I was 30. Yeah, I didn't care either. Um, also, you... You do care. It's a subconscious care. Even if you don't think you care, you care because that I, exactly. is like when... I outwardly cared when I got older. Exactly. But like yeah. when you're a teen, you're like literally figuring out. That's like the time in your life where for the yeah. first time you're thinking about who am I? And you're like putting together your identity. And it's like when you have this layered on top of it. Yeah. It's like and it's a hush hush thing. Were you allowed to say anything like um? Yes, I was. I, I, I was, but I really didn't push it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I was just kind of, I, I just sort of was like, okay, cool. And I just kind of sat with it for a while. Um, I think I instinctively knew, and, I, and I, it's just so common for donor conceived people. I was like, be careful. You don't want to hurt feelings. And I immediately yes. knew that. Because I, I knew that my dad was self-conscious. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I did not want to hurt my dad. And I really, like, instinctively at 14, I was like, I don't want to hurt him. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very careful with that. Um, I don't really think I started asking questions until I was probably about 18 mm -hmm. was when I started kind of carefully asking questions of like from my mom a little mm -hmm. bit more um but I think when it when I really started like w when it became um because I had a couple of people in my life who were adopted mm -hmm. and so I talked to them and they were wonderful because like obviously you know adoptees and donor can see people like it's not the exact same but there is an understanding oh yeah it's like um I don't know, DC and Marvel, it, but like coming together. <laughs> it really is. It, it really, we, we just understand each yeah. other. And I remember them being very supportive going like, hey, if you ever find them, you need help contacting, like I'm there for you. Mm -hmm. And it was always just this understanding that I always appreciated. But it wasn't until I think um, at 19 was when I called the doctor who made me and said that my pa my papers were burnt to the ground all the bank burnt to the ground along with my papers. And I remember that stuck in my head for a while because it was in college when I started getting interested in who the fuck this was, this guy. So you talked to him. I talked to the doctor who made me. Holy crap. And I will I've, 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 I will always tell the story because it, it haunts my brain for the rest of my life. I was 19, called him, and I was like, hello, sir. I'm like, I, I don't know if you know who I am, but I am Blotty, Boo, Blotty Blue's daughter. My name is Laura Hyde. Do you know who I am? And I remember it will always, he just went, yeah, 
I know who you are. And I remember that was one of those moments I was like, because you were the OG. Of course he's going to remember who you are. I'm sure any other donor conceived person that he made like probably wouldn't, you know, but you were the first. And I was just like, and it was suddenly like, I remember the tension was like so thick. Oh, he knew he got caught. He knew he something. Knew. Yeah, he knew. Because because how I was made was like insanely unethical. Yeah. Um, and so I was talking and I, and so it was just, and I remember that put a pin in it for me of going, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Something is not right. And it just sat there until Ancestry and 23andMe came around. Yep. And then it was just like, okay. And by that point, at that point, we were all starting to question what my ethnicity was. Your family too, yeah. Everybody was like, um, I think even my family was like, I don't know, maybe. But it really, and it was the amount of people who always, like, I, since I was, God, 12, 11, everybody's been asking me if I was Jewish. Really? Oh, yeah. Everyone always assumed mm -hmm. I was. Immediately always assumed. Yeah. Uh, and then I used to work in the Toys R Us at Times Square. No, you didn't. I did. Oh, bless you. I <laughs> did. And we would always get uh, members of the um, Hasidic Jewish community coming in. Uh-huh. And I remember there were uh, there was a different member because uh, I was on a on a team, and one of my other members I I I, I don't know I apologize because um, I've heard different answers many many times so I don't really I don't know but um, the other team member um, spoke Yiddish I believe mm -hmm. and so would speak a lot to like whenever um, you know the Hasidic Jewish community came in he would always communicate with them and it was great mm -hmm. and then they would come up to the second floor and see me and I think they just instinctively assumed I did as well mm -hmm. and they would start speaking Yiddish to me and I would go like I'm so sorry I'm not Jewish and they would look at me going and it happened so much this and, happened to me my whole life too yeah but like in Spanish yeah whole thing and I, they would, and I'd be like I'm so sorry I, I, I don't speak Yiddish and they'd be like oh no no, no problem but you are Jewish Jewish, though and I'm like no and they I remember a bunch of like the, the moms would just look at me and be like what they were like, mm. they were like girl and I remember they're like what are you then and they're like what are you sure and they were looking at me with like such like scruples going like do you do you, girl come back to Brooklyn with us like we'll find your family like it's okay oh like what's going like they did it like and that happened so many times mm -hmm. and I remember going okay something the fuck is up because this is happening way too much mm -hmm. i keep getting asked by by um i keep getting asked by by this community like something is is up and that mm -hmm. was like a, and so then when i found out i am 50 percent, it was like aha yup this is about this is about you though so no no okay. no that's I, okay that's crazy. We have like, it's funny because even though our like ethnic background is totally different, we have a lot of parallels. There's a lot of like a lot. Um, well, I'm just curious. Upper, Upper East Side doctor. I'm now yeah, just like so curious. We're going to have to have a chat afterwards. Oh my God. Okay. So you were sitting with this all through high school. And yep. And college. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, like you mentioned, like back when we found out, there was no 23andMe or Ancestry. There were no, no commercial DNA tests. I remember asking there my mom. There was no online forums. There was We had nothing, nothing. Nothing. And like I asked my mom, I was like, well, can I take a DNA test? And she was like, no, that kind of thing where it's not accessible. It's like what, you That's know. That's what the police officers use. Yeah, it's like detectives do that. Like yeah. we can't do that. What and do you think? You could just spit in the tube and mail it somewhere? <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, okay, <laughs> Star Trek. Like, get her. Oh, yeah. my God. So, so yeah, so I just kind of, like, tried to ignore this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then all of that did come out. And I remember when I'd see the commercials, my curiosity inside would perk up. And then I'd be like, no, we can't. We, like, we can't do that. Because, like, I got to keep this secret. And also, Aww. I knew. I knew if I took that, I knew I was going to open a can of worms. And I think that I knew... Um, that mentally and emotionally, I was not ready. Like yeah. I knew I was in a fragile place still. Yeah. Which I'm like, wow, that's like kind of like mature foresight to have for being a hot mess like I was. But um, so anyway, um, so 
you know, I went to school for musical theater. Um, Where did you go to school? Uh, Boston Conservatory. Ooh! Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yes, I went to Boston Conservatory. And, like, you know, senior year came around, and we're talking about, like, types, and we're talking about all this kind of stuff. And I started to really... Oh, I love those conversations. Oh, love they're it. not awkward whatsoever. They're like, I'm going to tell you what your type is. And they're not, like, you know, politically incorrect at all. Oh, no, they're not, They're not like, deriving from stereotypes. No, or, not yeah, at all. And, and make you incredibly self-conscious. Yeah, mm -hmm. and start insecurities, whatever. So I started feeling like really, really more self-conscious than I already felt. Um, and I already like it's funny, like I always was a performer since I was like a kid. Um, but I was really terrible at auditioning. And it's because I'm horrible at auditioning I, as well. I still am. I'm still horrible um at I actually it. don't audition very much like anymore, like, but I'm thinking about going back into it because I'm like curious, like now that I really know myself, I'm like, I wonder how I'd step into a room. Yeah. Because I think the reason why I was so bad at auditioning was because I felt like I needed to like hide because of this. Oh, yeah. So like I felt apologetic for myself before I even stepped into that room. And once I stepped mm. into the, and that's literally the opposite of what you need to do when yeah. you audition. You literally need to walk in and be like, here I am, folks. Like, I'm ready. This Kill is the me. lights. This is me. You are welcome. Let's get this Let's show. Go. Out of five, six, seven, eight. Exactly. And I would walk in and I'd be like, Hey guys, like, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm Aaron. Um, and what complicated it even more was back then I was using my legal name. Um, I had hadn't taken on a stage name yet, mm. and my legal name, which I have no problem saying now, um, is Aaron McShane. Let's sit with that. So it's like the most Irish name in the entire world, and so. I I know. So wow, this is the first time I'm actually saying that on a podcast. Oh my like, god, that is. Oh, I mean, it's a gorgeous name. It, it, but I. Thanks, but. Uh, but you know. I, I understand why that would cause some casting confusion. Oh yeah, and I, so I got an agent. I was very lucky to get like an agent, like from Showcase or whatever, like out yeah, of school. Yeah. And the agent sat me down after like sending me out on a bunch of stuff and I, I she was having a hard time getting me appointments mm -hmm. and she was like the feedback i'm getting from casting directors is that you are very confusing um they see your name aaron mcshane um and then they see your headshot and it doesn't make sense and you walk in the room and it doesn't make sense um and you know you are somebody that can be like you're very ethnically ambiguous very problematic term I that Back term, then, I didn't realize how problematic that was because hashtag white privilege. Well, because we graduated college, I guess, like the same year and like ethnically yeah. ambiguous. That term was like really hot oh, when we got yeah. out of college. Like that was the thing Like you needed to be ethnically. Ambiguous. And she like made it seem she was like, you're actually so lucky. Yeah. Like, you know. Oh, yeah. That um, was the hot term. I and she remember. was like, I can. She was like, if you take on a stage name, um, she was like, choose something that's like could be m many different things, like doesn't pinpoint one ethnicity, just very generic. Um, she was like, I can send you in for, I could send you in for Latino, I can send you in for Italian, I can send you in for Greek, I can send you in for literally, uh, and, and she was like, you're so lucky. We just like, your name not working, it's working against you. And so I was like, like fuck because uh, like that's my name that's my name yeah but after thinking about it i was like okay i'm i'm young and this agent is telling me that i'm gonna have opportunities if yeah. i you know and that me as myself is not getting me anywhere anyway and <sighs> you know maybe it's time to like turn a page so i thought long and hard about it and i decided to take my mentor's first name um maya um and she is a canadian white woman um, and her name is Maya and, but when I took her name as my last name, all of a sudden everybody in the industry thought I was Latino and I didn't mean to do that. Like that was not my intention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was thinking, oh, I'm taking someone's this first name. This industry is so fucking weird. Yeah. So it's I started so getting funny. so many appointments for Latino roles and I was, it was exciting, but I also felt like just as awkward as when I would feel feel like walking into a room for like a, a like a white girl character yeah i was like fuck like you know but but i actually was kind of like embraced yeah. in this way and so like my first job i booked was like in zapata the musical 
so inappropriate. <laughs> um, no, great show though. But um, but I felt like I was inappropriate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but but I actually like really loved the uh, Latino theater community and they completely embraced me and I was very like upfront about like, I was like, I don't actually know what like half of my ethnicity is. Okay. I just know I'm Irish. So like I would tell people that um, because I felt guilty for being there. Um, and, and people were really like excellent and embraced me. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I just, and my whole life I had actually felt very drawn to like Latino culture, like, um, some friends growing up, like when I'd go over to their houses, like, um, I have a Spanish friend and like, I would go over to her house and like her family just, they, they, they were expressive in a way that my family was not, um, not saying one is good or bad. But just like yeah, they were, Catholics. I just felt like I, yeah. yeah, like I just felt like I really like fit in there. I just remember thinking like, oh, I feel like I would fit in really well here. Um, like, let's turn up the music and like, let's chat and all that. Anyway, I just felt very like drawn to it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, in the business, whatever, uh, it kind of started weighing on me, mm-hmm. not knowing what I was. And then... This was, God, 2000 and, oh, God, I'm so bad at math. It was, like, around probably, like, 2018 or 19. No, 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 2000, like, Mm 17-ish. It was when people started finally calling out whitewashed casting, Mm -hmm. as they should. And they started calling people out who were doing it. Um, They started calling out the industry and talking about how messed up it was Mm -hmm. um, because there's plenty of talented, plenty of non-white people for these non-white roles. Um, But for me, as a donor conceived person who didn't know half her ethnicity, this was a conundrum. Yeah. Because I was like, I literally don't know what to do because I don't know if me being here is appropriate or not. Yeah. So I decided when I was 30 years old, I had like a whole mid midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to step away from the business and I'm going to take a DNA test Yep. and go to massage therapy school. Very random. That was like a really random detour that happened there. I love that. Really random. Anyway, so I take the DNA test. Results come back and I am 63 percent. Iberian Peninsula, it said, could be Spain, Portugal, Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. No specifics. But I matched with a second cousin. Whoa. And when I saw her picture, it was the first time I ever saw somebody with my eyes, (gasps) which was like jarring. Oh, my goodness. And I called my mom and I was like, uh, and I told her and she was so shocked. And she, I remember her saying on the phone, she was like, the doctor lied to us. Yep. And I was like, mm-hmm. it sucks being lied to. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we sort of like, mm-hmm. there was kind of like a common ground found there. Mm-hmm. And um, so I ended up meeting with this cousin who was really kind to meet me because a lot of times when people reach out to relatives. I totally don't mean to interrupt. Oh, but sorry. It, no, I, but it's, I feel like it's a, it's a very, int- it's a, it's a horrible thing. But I will say when, when recipient, it's a very interesting thing to have to watch happen because I've watched it as well with my parents when your parents realize the doctor lied to you Mm -hmm. and it's very interesting to suddenly watch your parent go like yep the light bulb and goes off off and you and you watch your parents like suddenly have their own little matrix moment Mm -hmm. and them going like holy shit and then it's and then they kind of like almost look at you a little bit different Mm -hmm. and um it's a very it's like I don't wish it upon anybody, mm-hmm. but it is one of those things where I've now watched it with a lot of recipient parents where they kind of have that moment of realization and it's powerful. It it's, takes a lot of self-awareness yeah. to allow that moment to happen. And I would ask recipient parents, like I understand like embracing that and letting that wave hit you. I I can't imagine how hard that is Mm -hmm. because I'm like, I, that's not my perspective, but the fact that like you are embracing the fact that your doctor lied to you and now you are looking at your child 
I can't imagine the fear, the guilt, the the mix. Like I can't imagine it. But mm-hmm. I ask recipient parents to let that wash over you. You sit in it. Know that it is going to be okay. But I, we, we, as donor can see people, we need you to sit in it for a little bit. We, because mm-hmm. that's that, that right there is like, that's the starting point. And that's where we can take that point and move forward. Sitting in it is sitting with us. Yeah. And it that's, really what, and that's what we need. Because even if you decide, because if you, the more that you are like, nope, not going to deal with it, not going to deal with it, like, mm-hmm. we have to. It's our body. Mm-hmm. We have to deal with the fact, no matter what, that the doctor lied. Mm-hmm. We have to. So I ask you to sit with us. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to, to sort of like do no. that little little TED Talk moment. But okay, no, so no, going. it's important. It's important. So your mom. So, so now your your mom has had her aha moment. So she, my mom had her aha moment. I met this cousin um, who's really kind to meet with me. She had me meet her at a Cuban restaurant, and as soon as I walked in and I saw her, it was like a movie moment I'll never forget, like seeing someone with my eyes. <sighs> and we sat down, and she was like, "So I picked this restaurant." for a reason because we are Cuban as fuck. And and she was like, you know, it doesn't say that on the DNA test because like we are Cuban by way of Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, it didn't say it on the DNA test, but she was like, we are super duper Cuban. Cuban um, and she gave me like a whole bunch of background. She was really, really generous. And I told her, it, it was like the first time I was like, I- I'm curious to know who this the donor is like that was something else I had never allowed myself to really embrace because it felt like such a betrayal Mm -hmm. to like want to know who this person Mm -hmm. was again a lot of donor conceived Mm -hmm. people are gonna all go yes it does feel like a betrayal to want to know it does it does and like somebody who also lost their dad so young I I can't help that there was this feeling deep deep down that I did not want to like Yep. show the light to that I was like oh there's another dad out there yeah like which is you know there are just a lot of complicated feelings about that you know it is but it, it's it is complicated like that's mm-hmm. the thing there's no way to not have this be complicated mm-hmm. and the complication is beautiful it's not a bad thing mm-hmm. it's beautiful and if we sort of we're trying to make a very complicated situation as simplistic as possible, which I'm like, that's not that's not what this ever is going to be. Never. Donor conception is complicated. There's no mm-hmm. way to uncomplicate it. Allow it to be complicated mm-hmm. and embrace it. It will be OK. Yep. That's the only way you can move forward yeah. is by just embracing the fact that it is complicated. Yeah. Um, and that there is like no rule book. No. <laughs> literally, literally. Literally no rule book. No fucking fertility fucking clinics. No rule, rule book. book. Thank you. Um, yes, we have our guidelines. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah. Who's ever listened to guidelines? Literally. Well, we anything. learned that from um, Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, it's more like a guideline. Like we, we, <laughs> we know that it's like no one fucking follows guidelines. Like no, we know that. Not at all. So, yeah. So um, so basically she like meeting her really yeah. gave me like the the drive to figure mm-hmm. out who this person was. And for the next three years, I worked my ass off trying to find the donor. So she didn't know. She did not know. Um. She was able to, like, give me some, um, like, information okay. on online. There's a family tree. Like, somebody, some someone in the family is, like, um, into uh, history, family history and everything and had, like, documented, like, back, like, four generations. Mm-hmm. Amazing. It was public. So um, it wasn't, like, you know, intrusive or anything. So, like, I looked at that, but so much of it was in Spanish. And unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish. Now I speak a tiny, tiny bit. But um, but then I didn't speak any. Yeah. And so for three years, I was going through this and like translate Google translating and like trying to figure yeah. this out. Um, and then it was not until the pandemic. Good old love the good pandem- old pandemic. Yeah. Finally have time. <laughs> and two weeks into it, uh, my best friend, who is also adopted, also found out he was Latino later in life. We have wow. way too many similarities. Um, he was over, he was quarantining with me, and uh we basically put two and two together. Um, and he was like, I think you're a generation off because like I, the Centimorgans, they can sometimes uh, the um, mm-hmm. 
you know what I'm talking about? Like the the Santa Morgans can be like two different things. Like you could be it could be a, a third cousin or it could be a second cousin once removed. Yeah. Like it's in that bracket. And he was like, I he was like, I think you might be looking at the wrong generation like let's try looking at this generation as soon as we did it was like literally glaring at me um because he it said he was he had been raised in jersey um he was an immigrant uh and he was a medic he was a, med a medical doctor so i was like all right Oh, um, yeah, there it is. Yeah, there we go. There it is. The doctor, um, the medical, if they're in, that's what I always tell people, Mike, if they're in the fucking medical field. Yeah. There we go. So, um, and, you know, that's all I'll say about that because I want to protect his privacy, of, of course. course. Um, yeah. But uh, we looked him up on Facebook and he's very public with his life. And uh, and there was my face. There, there was my face Ooh. right there. And it was the first time, like, I saw someone legit, like, with my face. <sighs> and I, it was like the pieces just came together, you know? Yeah. And it was so exciting. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to be so, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist in many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I watched too many movies, so I'm always waiting for a happy ending. Um, and so, well, we're music theater kids. We're musical theater, so we're kids. like, it's the eleven o'clock hour. I was like, yeah, the eleven o'clock number is here. We're here. Yes. And so I was like, he's going to be so excited to be. He's going to be so excited to know I exist. I mean, oh no, Aaron. Oh no, oh, no, no. Um, oh, I mean, no. I was really nervous that it wasn't going to go that way, but I was like. No, like this has to because like I'm so happy that like I figured out who he is. Like he's yeah. gotta be happy. Like I'm a good person and I'm an adult. Like I don't need it's not like I'm looking for a parent. Like yeah. um and so I wrote an email. I took took so many drafts. So many drafts, checking yes. in with people, being like, this doesn't seem to this, this doesn't seem to yep. that. I don't want to make it seem like I'm looking for anything except yep. my medical history, because at the time I was engaged um, and I had planned on, you know, hopefully having a kid in the next couple of years. That did not go how the way I planned. That's another story for not, another podcast. Different podcast. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So finding my accurate medical history was really important to me and just knowing where I came from was important to me because I was like, if I want to bring a life into this world in the next couple of years, I want to be good with myself. Yeah. I don't want to like project any of this onto my kid. I don't want inherited trauma, which is a <laughs> thing. Yeah. So I was like, oh, yeah. you know, I'm going to write to him and get some answers about who I am. And so I wrote and uh, he had his employee, right back to me oh, who, who's actually really his sister and i know because i know the name because i did my research um, oh my god oh um, my oh but okay had, i'm bracing I'm yeah bracing. but he had his employee right okay. back to me um right. which is really his sister and basically just being like he is not interested in connecting um he did this for money your parents needed a child um like and wish you the best and you know because you because you worked so hard to find him, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis runs in the family. Um, we wish you the best of luck. Looks like your parents got a happy, healthy baby girl, whatever. It was very like in, in, infantilizing. Is that is that the word? I don't I, I, I don't I, know I, if I'm I, pronouncing I, that correctly. I don't know. But anyway, I'm just like oh, I just, that, it was it was like how uh, that, that sounds like like the most corporate of emails. It was very corporate and that's what it sounds like it, it, it's out it, i i feel like it was like let's just uh we'll we'll circle back around like i i oh no no intention of circling so no back with around. no intention of circling yeah. back around let's put a pin in this yeah um and so i just wrote back and i was like uh well i will respect his wishes but let him know that the door is always open on my side and that's it and he's never opened that door and i have respected dude I know. Dude, I know. come on. Sometimes, like, I wonder, I'm like, does he even care a little bit to even, like, like look at my socials ever? Or, like, will he listen to this podcast? And it's like... Oh, I have questions about that, I too, always well. wonder yeah. about things like that. And it's like, uh, you know, as 
as hurtful and awful yeah. as that truly was because honestly it sent me down like kind of like a, a depression spiral again of like losing my dad again I, I literally went through okay, the grief okay so we, we did the three we're now on our third morning third your... morning of my my dad who raised me like it literally sent me back in a spiral about my dad who raised me oh my god um, now I really make it, it makes sense at the beginning of the podcast where you were like I like musicals with dead dads yep. now I'm like okay now it makes sense okay yep. now we, People, we... you're probably are like what the fuck now I'm like aha <laughs> all right it's a theme which is why I wrote a dead dad musical yes um, <laughs> so oh yeah my. so that's basically the story and like honestly even though that really really sucked um I if he ever was open to communication again I would I would still be open to it um I maybe would, we just haven't hit the 11 o'clock hour yet. maybe maybe it's just we're still somewhere hasn't come yet we haven't <sighs> I, but I don't know. But maybe I've grown into my inner heroine, and I just don't need this anymore. But uh, Ooh, okay, so there we go. 11 o'clock there hour. we go. Different eleven o'clock number. Anyway, honestly, it really affected though writing this musical, which I feel like this is probably a good segue. Which is, <laughs> I, I, which I, I so yes, yeah, so, so I'd love to talk about the musical that you have written, which I I love because I, obviously, like as a stand-up comedian, um, and I love the fact that there is you know other people who are creatively expressing their donor conceived story in other mediums mm -hmm. and of course the fact that you've like written a musical i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> is there dancing sperm can i audition god i hope god i hope uh, i love this so i yeah no tell tell us all about the tell us all about the musical yeah so uh it was about it's taken me three years to write mm -hmm. um it started out as like an idea just sitting in the diner with my best friend the adopted one who also is like an accomplished composer mm -hmm. writer and i was telling him i was like i really want to i really want to like write a a donor conceived musical because there's never been a musical about donor conception and we have barely any media from the donor conceived person's you perspective. You mean zero. You mean we have zero. Well, yeah. We have, we have zero. Pretty I mean, much zero. Again, our father. Our father. Is that's it. it. That's all we got. That's it. That's yeah. that. That is our one thing we've got. They've tried yeah. to write uh, for us many times and failed miserably because mm -hmm. why put donor conceived people actually in the writing room? By the way, I am available for hire. Um, <laughs> Listen up, people. Listen up. Uh, yeah, no, why? Yeah, they've, they've never done that. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I was like, I, I'm not the kind of person, like, when it comes to advocacy, I'm a communicator. I like to talk with people and have personal, I'm a Pisces. Let's talk about the failings, you know? Um, when it comes to, like, all of, like, the bills and the and the legal part of it, that is not my strength. Mm -hmm. Like, there are other smarter donor conceived people to do that kind of stuff. Um, but I was like, what can I do for advocacy? I can do art. <laughs> um, Which is amazing. Because and, that's, yeah. uh, I mean, that we can see that that people, like, art makes these tough emotions much more easily, easy to digest. And mm -hmm. it hits you in places that you're like, ooh, I didn't know that emotion was there. Thank you so much. Yes. And if it's, like, done well, it doesn't feel like a soapbox. Yes. And so it's easy for people to put themselves in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. for a moment. Um, and so I had written this song with my band, Aaron Maya and the Reckoning. Follow us on Instagram. Um, we, I had written this song about my own donor conceived story called No More Waiting. And the song had like resonated with a lot of pe people were like, what is this about? And so it would spark these conversations and they'd be like, what? donor conceived person i've never heard that term before wow that sounds like it could be a movie you know like things like that um and then you know obviously it connected me with other donor conceived people and stuff and so i was like hmm maybe this could be a musical so thought about that and it just took a really long time to like commit to actually writing it because i was figuring out my own story still and i feel like you have to kind of like digest your own story before yeah. you write about something i don't know um so, yeah, so I started writing the story and it started out kind of autobiographical at first. Mm -hmm. And then the more my own story started to change, the more the musical story evolved. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to realize, oh, it's more dramatically interesting to change this character make this character more this this is going to be we, i need an antagonist so like you know the mom character 
evolved into like somebody who's a lot more like antagonistic because like that's what the show needed mm -hmm. and like you know the character that originally was kind of like loosely based off of me uh became like somebody who's really bad at talking about feelings you know because that's a lot more interesting and there's an arc there so the story it's basically it's a rock musical because that's what i know I is love rock music it. <laughs> um and it's basically about a 36 year old photographer named kira and she finds herself um in an unexpected pregnancy with her boyfriend of many years and they decide to have it but this uh basically ignites uh, this desire to figure out who she is because mm -hmm. she um, doesn't know where she comes from. She also found out that she was doing her conceived when she was young. That That's similar to my story. Um, so basically this sends her on a, a search mm -hmm. to complete her identity so that she doesn't pass this on to her kid, yeah. this question mark. Um, and I love it. I decided to keep the as one aspect of my own story in the show which is the dad character um who the dad who raised her i i kept the fact that he passed when she was young mm -hmm. because um i think that when it comes to like when people find out their donor conceived there's a lot of grief there just like a death and mm -hmm. there's a lot of grief having to do with your um, recipient parent too and a lot of it is unresolved and so um, for me, I was like, I want to keep this dad character and this is her like unresolved grief personified. Yeah. So basically the show is like her and her dad who is like in her mind and heart and they're trying to work out their relationship while he can't pass. He can't like move on mm -hmm. until she is OK. Yeah. And so they go on this like whole journey basically to like figure out who she is and find the donor before the baby's born. Yeah. Wow. Hope that was a good description. I, <laughs> I love it. Now, Thanks. okay. Now I obviously want to come. I want to support. I want to like, you. how, how does one support come see this? Like, what do we do? Yes. Um, so, so we have a bunch of social media. Um, we have a new Instagram page, which is at the complete picture musical, um, which I probably should have said that it's called the complete it's picture. The complete right? picture. There well, we go. We know. There okay. we go. Now we know it's called the complete picture. Hence she's a photographer. I love um, it. Yes. So uh, at the complete picture. Um, and also there's a website, www thecompletepicturemusical.com we'll have all of these links in the con in the caption amazing um and we just did a fundraiser and so we're doing a concert debuting the music in january <gasps> so that's going to be in new york city at the green room so if i wanted to come to that mm -hmm. how do i buy tickets okay you can either go to green room 42's website okay and it is monday january 9th at 7 p.m there are in-person tickets and there's also live stream tickets for any of you that are not in the did you, did, area. You, did you all hear that there are live stream tickets so we all can watch this together yes oh, okay and so i can get so i'm i so we, i'm gonna get all the links for whether it's a ticket in person or it's a live mm -hmm. stream we're gonna put it in the caption yes and also the link is um on the social media as well so okay. So you can either Google Green Room 42 or you can go to the Complete Picture Musical Instagram and yeah, and get your tickets because there's 28 tickets sold already. It's like actually selling really, really oh, quickly. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So if you want to come in person, like I definitely would say, you know, OK, I got to get, your get tickets my ticket. Quick. Yeah. Um, OK. So, yeah, it's like really exciting. We're debuting the music and uh, I'm excited to see how it goes okay so everybody this is what we're gonna do we're all gonna go buy our tickets like right now yes. um i'm gonna see all of you there i want to see everybody in person or i will see you on the interwebs um because we want to support more donor conceived stories through art and we want to support them being told with the person with the lived experience and we Thank always want to support the person with the lived experience no matter what that story is i think it's just so there's so much more nuance to it and I'm I am freaking out that there's going to be a donor conceived musical like I know I'm like I'm so excited like and and I would love it if there were a lot of donor conceived people in the audience like that yes. the energy 
energy of that would be just I like mean, so excellent. The industry made enough of us. We can do it, guys. <laughs> like, come on. There's enough of us out there. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, um, Aaron, I am so January 9th. Uh, January 9th. January 9th. J- January 8th. Oh, Janu- my God. Oh, my God. That would have been so bad. January 8th, guys. January, January, 8th. January 8th at 7 p.m. Monday, January 8th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, guys. So January 8th, 7 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to see you all there. We will be there with bells on. It's going to be amazing. Yes. Um, and because we, we're going to do it. We're going to. It's going to be amazing. So uh, Aaron, thank you for sharing your amazing story. Thank um, I, I amazing maybe maybe not the word. Th- thank you for being as amazing as you are for sharing your story. I think that's better wording. Appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your vulnerability. Um, thank you and thank you for sharing your story through your art. I I, I absolutely love that and I am so excited to to see it. Um, and now yeah. we are going to conclude the podcast so that we can actually ask uh, who the fuck your doctor <laughs> was on the Ever East Side. So we can figure this out. So oh. I'm so sorry. Guys, but we got to end this podcast now because I got to fucking know. Um, <sighs> but everybody, please um, go follow Erin Maya. Please go support her. And as well with like, you know, with insemination, please follow. Please follow me at, at Laura High Five on Instagram, on Facebook and on uh, on the the TikTok. <laughs> the TikTok. The that TikTok. That is a dead giveaway that, that you're an elder millennial like <laughs> myself. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I, I mean, I'm. I we we. I, I asked. I was like, "Were you a hot topic kid?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we already we that was already out there. Yep. It ha- we're just embracing it. The fuck now, okay? You and I are gonna go get some Dunkaroos. It's gonna be a good time. Oh my god, yes, yes. All right. with Mondos. Oh, absolutely. All right, thank you all. Thank you again, Aaron, and thank everybody. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for doing this. Like, what you do for our community is huge, and I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. It's at, it's at my pleasure, and it's it's a community effort. It, that's what it is as you know as we got to learn at the protest thank god we have our community mm-hmm. and to, together we um we swim strong <laughs> <laughs> thank you again <laughs>